So, two week break. Um, not a lot of content up to this point and now we're going to hit the fire hydrant basically. There, there will be information coming at you left, right and centre. Um, I think the information that you're getting and the learning you'll be doing is a lot more practical than that very first week. Um, it's really frustrating that first week because we're doing effectively a lot of things that is getting ourselves set up but also the readings are all the jurisprudence. So um, that will, we'll keep coming back to those theories uh, and we'll work from there. So um, a very, very, very small number of you did my little reflection task. Um, there will be one of those each week. Um, there's a little bit in it for you and a little bit in it for me. Uh, I don't distinguish particularly between the OUAs and the face-to-face -face students doing that, um, but it does give me a bit of a sense of what's working and what's not. So, the question's for you. Um, there's a hell of a lot of research, I think I started talking about it the other day, that says that if you write things down, you retain them and you think about them. So I would suggest that you ask yourselves these questions after almost every class, um, whether it's my subject or anything else, ranging from liturgical dance to astrophysics. Um, what was the most challenging thing for you in the week for the topic? Uh, this week, Basically, everybody said, yeah, there was too much reading, it was really dense and it was hard to follow. Uh, that didn't surprise me. Um, there's nothing very much I can do about it. It will continue to feel that way for a little while and then, God bless you all, at some point you'll start thinking like lawyers and it'll all start making sense to you and a little bit of your soul will be broken as a consequence, but let's not dwell on that. Um, so again, that leads to the what was the most interesting Often actually spending a second identifying what's most interesting to you helps you think about where you want to do your deep dives, where you want to find out more, how you want to deal with the content. Um, I only had six responses. Look at how many people there are in the room, plus there's another 10 or so at home. Um, so clearly it's not a representative sample, but it was interesting to me that all of those six responses, and if you go and do this little thing, you can see what they are, they were all different. So everybody's finding something interesting and they're all different from each other. Um, materials, that's a little bit for you and a little bit for me. Um, the asking you about the materials is not actually me asking for a pat on the back about how pretty my slides are. What I'm actually really asking you to do there is think about the way you learn and which of the either the activities or the readings or the materials actually worked for you so that you can work out what order to do things. I'm working on the base of basis that all of you are first year law students, which means all of you, you're all doing a JD, you've all done an undergraduate degree at some point in the recent or the uh, distant past. Um, but what you've studied is likely to have been significantly different in most, not all, but in most cases. Um, I will tell you myself, I, for me, I am more likely to do something meaningful if, uh, with the information if I read the textbook before I read the cases. I've got a sense then of what the, where the cases might fit and, and how they're fitting together. I often do it with a list of the cases that are in the case book beside me so that I, when I'm actually reading, I can notice if the case is mentioned in a particular way. So because particularly for me, the old cases, the language is sometimes difficult, uh, the points are lost and it can be quite difficult uh, otherwise. Others will find that if they do that, that they miss, miss the trees for the forest, that they don't pick up the detail because they're too busy looking for the thing they think they should be looking at and it worries them that they're not catching everything. Again, everybody's going to be different. It's a small example, but I think it's just something you need to think about. Um, the real nub of the question for me is I want to know at the end of each week when you've been through the materials, you've had the class, and from Sunday, before Sunday night, where because from this Sunday onwards we'll be doing the tute, I want to know where you've had the most trouble. Um, because firstly that tells me where I'm not explaining something correctly and I think it was Einstein who said, uh, if you keep doing the same thing to solve a problem, uh, chances are you're going to get the same results. I'm paraphrasing, 
He would have said exactly that, but in German. Um, no, it's just attributed that sort of idea to him. So, um, if I haven't explained something clearly, or the text isn't explaining it clearly, or the exercises that we do aren't helping you, uh, then the more I know about where you're having uh, not necessarily issues, um, but where you want to know more or you're not seeing how it fits together, the more likely I am to be able to bring things together. So um, one of the things in particular that came through with the feedback on the survey this time, it's a couple of people, and it's more generally, first year issue, still trying to get their heads around what a citation means um, and how that works. Uh, and also starting to think about how citation will work and what referencing will look like. Because there is that nasty little piece with referencing in any materials. Firstly, there is making sure you acknowledge your sources, the academic integrity piece, which I'm sure you've had explained to you in great detail how absolutely important that is. And I can go back and do it again if you want to because it breaks my heart when we have to send people to disciplinary committee proceedings because the consequences are so significant. There's that part of the, qu of the issue, but then there's also just getting the formatting right. And that's a form over substance thing. Um, and it's not a popular position. I think it's really boring. I just don't see how it's useful. I finally had a good look at AGLC4 and I don't think it solves any of the problems that we used to have. But the reality is that's what we have to do. That is the formatting that we have to use. And particularly when it comes to your writing and organising your writing for those part of the marks, if you don't get the formatting as well as the referencing right, it's very hard for me to give you anything above a credit, even when you are absolutely brilliant. And let's face it, most of you are. Um, Feedback to me, yes, I do ask for feedback about what's working and what's not working. Um, every class is different, you're sort of different beasts. Uh, so I do ask those questions, what should I keep doing because it's working for you? What should I stop doing because it's annoying you? Um, please give me that information. But even if you can't be bothered with those last two questions, each week try and answer the others because it will help focus your attention. Um, I also asked you to do a little quiz for me. Again, only a small number of people did it, 12. So um, let me just see if I can move this here without hurting myself. So we have winners. Of course you do. Uh, so again, when you do it, you can be as anonymous as you like, but they were our top five performers in the quiz. There were 12 of you who did it. That's a very small number. Um, on the whole, like nobody got everything right. As you can see, there were 11 questions, uh, nine correct answers, and there were a few patterns. Um, one of the things I noticed is that um, people answered the questions very quickly. Um, maybe that's just because that's how you're used to doing cahoots. It does run out, um, but it shows me, for example, here, where only 42% of people got the what is common law question right. You had 30 seconds to answer that. Um, most people, the mean was at 7.5, and the range only went up to 13.1 seconds. So again, that tells me, oh, I'm all a little bit anxious about that. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, anxiety can be our friend. It can also be our enemy. Be careful, be careful. Um, these were actually, some of them were surprisingly tricky questions for multiple choice. Uh, so they are worth having a look at. Um, but I'm going to do one of those every uh, week as well, basically to see how you're going with the learning. Speaking of which, hopefully, oh no, the next slide is not going to do it. Um, I've actually got one I prepared earlier for us to do a quick one right now. So if while I'm messing around to find the page uh, or the web page, if you could access a device that connects to the internet, your phone will be fine. And yes, as you can see, it shows a leaderboard, so if you want to use a name that is not a swear word, you go right ahead and do that. Um, 
Now for you at home, hopefully I will remember to edit this bit out, but I will also make this um, Kahoot available to you uh, so that you can do it on your own time. So with the magic of editing, I have actually just deleted a section of mucking around right here. What I'm going to recommend you do if you weren't in class is take a look at the Kahoot code that's on the screen now. Have a go at doing the quiz so that you know for sure what your answers will be. And then I know it's a little bit dull, but then have a look at the video where the class does the quiz and have a uh, and we discuss each of the answers as we go through them so you can think about your own responses. Good luck with it, hey? A unilateral contract, in a unilateral contract, only one party has a contractual obligation. True or false? I love the way it gets faster and faster. <laughs> Okay, so 17 of you got that one right. It was, however, sorry? Oh, 17 got it. Oh, okay, it's the colours. I went with the colour. I'm just using colour coding. Um, okay, 10 of you got it right. So as a true answer, many of you got it wrong. I think there's a good reason that you might have got that wrong. I think there is an argument uh, the other way. Is anybody, you don't have to out yourself as to how well or badly you did. Does anybody want to um, proffer a, um, a reason why a unilateral contract might only have, uh, might need more than one party? Surely all contracts need multiple parties. Yeah, there's a good reason to say no. In a unilateral contract, only one party has a contractual obligation at a time. So at the point in time when the contract is made, the offeror has already completed their obligations. So it is incorrect to say that there is a form of contract where there is only one party. That's not what that says. So often we have to go to the detail in the language, uh, which is further heightened by the lack of words. So it is correct to say that in a unilateral contract, so an executory unilateral contract, only one party has contractual obligation. And I think a second ago I said offeror when I meant offeree. So at the point, sorry, I did say offeror, so I apologise for that because that was clumsy of me. At the point in time that the contract is made, and we'll discuss this at some length later this evening, the offeree has met their obligation and so the only remaining obligation is for the offeror, usually to pay money at that point in time. All right. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this and one of the reasons why the, uh, um, the questions are a little bit tricky is this is kind of a shortcut way for me to work out where I focus my attention. So Question two, unilateral contract obligations are executory at the time of contract formation. Another way of putting that is in a unilateral contract, the obligations of both parties at time of contract formation are executory. I actually really like the sound of the bubbles over the music. That's pop, pop, pop. Whoa, even, even, even. So what's the trick to answering this question? What do you need to know? Well, you need to know what a unilateral contract is. What else? Sorry, can you tell me your name? Because I just... Karen. Uh, Karen. This is executed at performance. Executed at... Well, you need to understand what the word... Ex, ex, executory means don't you so you've taken that one step further to say is it executed at performance um, and let's unpick that in a second but what does executory mean sign sealed delivered stamped. sign sealed delivered stamped 
You had me until you added stamped. Well, but, Tell me what signed, sealed, delivered means. It's basically been signed off. It's been, in my experiences, it's just been, it's, it's, it's been signed. Yeah. It's been It's closed. been signed. It's closed. Okay, yeah. we'll come back to that. It's Will, is That's that right? right? Yeah. That was very, That's we've good. got a bill in here as well, haven't we? Where Billy. are you, Bill? Billy? Yep. That's Billy. Okay, sorry. I will get the names eventually. Okay, so hold on to that thought. The short answer is no. Um, there's a longer answer. There always is. Executory. What does that mean? Karen was on the right track there. She started to think about the, uh, what the issue is. She's used the word performance. What do we think that means? So is it to say that one, sorry, one party has already performed their side? So the one party, contract? sorry, I'm repeating for the recording That's as right. much as anything else. Um, so one party has performed their obligation. Mm -hmm. So there are obligations yet to, to be, be performed. Sure. So in short, an executed contract is a complete contract. Now, executed can be used in two, wo uh, two ways. When we use it uh, effectively in a verb-like sense, we're saying a contract is executory or it, um, yet to be executed. We mean that there is one or more parties that have not yet performed their obligation. But sometimes we use it, it's effectively a noun, the contract well, actually, we use this verb. The contract's been executed or I've seen... So we use executed as a synonym for signature. Because the study of law is all about getting precise words and then throwing in a whole lot of similar words just to confuse everybody. OK, so we'll talk about performance as we go. Oh, a change in the leaderboard already. Which of the following is true? A unilateral contract cannot be made to the public at large. A unilateral con offer, sorry, the first one should have been offer. A unilateral offer can be made only to a specific person. A unilateral offer must be made to the public at large. A unilateral offer can be made to the public at large. Sorry, they're hard for you to see through those posts, aren't they? But you, can you see them on your devices, what the questions are? Just go and look over your shoulders. You can see the colour. Okay. So do you need me to say that? So the triangle is a unilateral offer cannot be made to the public at large. Diamond, a unilateral offer can be made only to a specific person. Circle, a unilateral offer must be made to the public at large. Square, a unilateral offer can be made to the public at large. Devil's in the detail. All right. Most people went straight to the right thing. So effectively, the devil is in the detail here with that word can. So it is actually true that a unilateral offer can be made to a specific person or a specific group of people, but that's not the only way it can be made. A unilateral offer, um, it's not true the unilateral offer can I hate double negatives. A unilateral offer cannot be made to the public at large is untrue and unilateral offers must be. So we, we've got that distinction. Again, we'll come to those a bit but I don't see a huge issue there. Another true or false, there's no real difference between a unilateral contract and a bilateral contract. When all is said and done. Oh, tune seems to have changed. All right, most people on the right track there. Um, once the contract is actually, contract law still applies to both. Um, in fact, at one level, because it's so much part of understanding what an offer is, is this case Carl Hill and Carbolic Spoke Ball, which we'll spend quite a bit of time on today. Uh, and a large part of that case goes to this distinction between a unilateral and a bilateral contract. Let me give you a hint that will save all of us a lot of grief. 
The question about whether a contract is unilateral or bilateral is hardly ever relevant. The only time it is relevant is if the contract is perceived to be or potentially a unilateral arrangement. Uh, because that gives us some outs in relation to the order that things happen in. But almost every contract that you deal with will be bilateral. So it's hardly ever relevant to tell me that a contract is bilateral. It's like having a whole field full of sheep and pointing out to me that one's a sheep, that one's a sheep, that one's a sheep, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a whole field full of sheep and then saying to me, actually, there's a goat over there. So the second is a useful piece of information, the rest isn't. So think about why you're telling me these things as you go ahead. WTs on fire. Which of the following would not be considered an invitation to treat? A department store catalogue showing goods and prices for them, a bid made at an auction house, a call for written tenders for the sale of a warehouse, or a brochure summarising the details of NBN plans. NBN just came to my area. I'm fixated with it. Does it work? It works awesome. You have no idea. They sent me a letter. They said, in your area, you can get up to 100 megabits a second. We've tested and you're getting 109 megabits a second. If you want to complain, I'm like, I was getting six megabits a second. <laughs> I'm not complaining about anything. Now, I'm so excited. OK, I need to get that screen working to make it a little bit easier for people to see. Right, a range of different answers here. So, we will discuss that, hopefully as we get there later today. But a bid made at an auction house is not an invitation to treat. We will talk about invitations to treat. All others are examples of invitation to treat. So, you just thought my obsession with the NBN was a hint. <laughs> I'm not actually that nice. Oh, Tracy's taken the lead. Uh, which of the following is not a method for terminating an offer? Fulfillment of a condition precedent. Oh, the music even goes. Lapse of a stipulated time period for acceptance. Rejection by the offeree. Revocation by the offeror. Plenty of time here, you don't have to rush. One of these things is not like the other things. One of these is not a method for terminating an offer. Tell me which one. I might have allowed too much time on it, I think. <laughs> I don't work out. Oh, everybody's in. Most people saw that what is it, Arnie? Whenever I put Arnie on a slide, everybody gets it right. Um, so again, we'll talk about revocation. Uh, a couple of people might have to have a bit of a look at it, but it looks like we're all on a similar page at least. So, applause to Tracy. You can out yourself if you want to. Um, but good, that gives me a good start to know what's going on. Now I just have to try and make this work again. Come on. No, I don't want Camtasia. Go away. Ah, la, la, la. All right, so what are we going to do today? We're going to talk mainly about offers. So this topic, topic two, we cover it over weeks two and three. We've kind of skipped week two. I'm just keeping the numbers the same because otherwise I'd have to change everything in Canvas and I could spend my time doing better things. Uh, so I think of this as week two. Uh, again, it's a big topic, but we're going to talk about a number of different elements of what a contract is as we go forward. Um, and so we do need to start by actually identifying what the elements of a contract are and thinking about why they matter. So, the first and foremost reason why you want to know what a contract is, is that you need to solve contract problems. So, specifically, problems that we give you as assignments or on a test 
probably the first kind of contract problems that you're going to deal with. But as lawyers, there are two kinds of contracts problems that come across your desk. The first is making a contract. People want to do a deal. How are you going to do that? What do you need to include and why? And how do you know when you take it off the printer that one last time that you've got everything in it that it needs to be a contract? And secondly, to deal with disputes that people have in relation to a contract. So mostly when we're dealing with contract problems, we're asking ourselves this question to start off with. Is there even a contract? Is this a problem about formation of contracts? And for the most part, at least for the first half of this course, every problem you will get will effectively turn itself into, is there a contract here or not? necessarily because of what we're studying. In the real world, unfortunately, people don't come into your office and say, yes, it's week six of the financial year, you should be up to consideration by now. So it doesn't work that way. Um, so in order to, um, to think about these things, we also need to think about who can sue for a breach of contract as well. So in order to work out who can sue, we also need to be able to work out who the parties to a contract are. Um, we also then, if there isn't a contract problem, as lawyers we might, or th sorry, if there, the, there is a problem but there isn't a contract, there might be some other method for solving that problem. So we might think about whether there is another way to enforce a promise. Now we will look at some of those ways here, in particular over the next 12 weeks we'll talk about a estoppel a number of times. Um, estoppel is an equitable remedy uh, and I'll explain later what that means but effectively it's the court asking a question is there a reason why somebody should be the word is estopped and it effectively means stopped from enforcing some right that they have for fairness or otherwise so it only comes up in some very limited circumstances, but we will need to look at that. Um, of course, if there is a contract, we need to identify what the terms of the contract are, and we need to work out how to understand them. And we'll do quite a bit of that over the course of the semester, particularly in the second half, and we need to identify from that what the specific rights and obligations of the parties at, in the case at hand will be. Okay, that's not going to work for me today, as it seems, yet again. Um, so, to determine whether there is a contract, we are going to need to do these things. You, I would suggest, will start to have this as a kind of mantra in your head. Every time that we find a contract, we need to find these formation elements. Is there agreement? Is there consideration for the moment for the next two weeks, we're going to call that price, but we will quickly learn that price is not a clear enough term or a, a broad enough term. We will need to look at intention and we need to look at whether there is certainty. Each of these has a, a legal meaning. In relation to agreement, sorry, the print on that is quite small. Um, when I went to university, we actually split this up into two things. Instead of calling it agreement, we called it offer and acceptance. But these days, we refer to it as agreement for good reason, because particularly in an electronic age, it can be very difficult to clearly find an offer and a matching acceptance. Um, and in commercial transactions, it hardly ever happens. Agreements are negotiated clause by clause by clause. And to end up with this artificial distinction would be meaningless. So ultimately, we are looking for consensus. Um, but we really only look for that consensus piece if we can't match an offer and an accepted acceptance that has in fact been communicated. Consideration, we're calling this price, but ultimately it goes to the question of whether the parties have struck a bargain or not. Now in Carl Hill, where we spend quite a bit of our time today, that ultimately is one of the key questions. Did the parties strike a bargain? Was there an agreement for uh, the Carbolic Smokeball Company to actually pay Mrs. Carl Hill some money? 
Again, intention comes into most of these as well. Intention and consideration go hand in glove in some respects. We have consideration because it is a way of demonstrating an intention to be bound. Uh, and at the same time, we need to have intention that goes to the quality of the bargain itself. And certainty too goes to the question of whether the parties have clearly identified the rights and responsibilities that they intended to have. So often, in order to work out whether or not we have agreement, particularly when we need the offer and acceptance analysis, we're actually also looking at whether or not the parties' agreement is su sufficiently certain, whether the promises are not illusory. So again, you'll see I'll spend a lot of time and historically, people have gotten nervous that I'm spending too much time on the early topics and you think maybe we won't get finished we will be able to speed up later because there's a whole lot of foundational stuff that we'll get through, particularly over the first, or well, before Easter. So, all the time as you're reading these cases in this section, I would be focusing on thinking about what we need to create a contract and why we need to know whether there's a contract in the first place. Do we need to know whether there's a contract because it's only if we know whether there's a contract that we know we can sue for a broken promise? Do we need to know whether there's a contract or not so we can identify who the parties are? What is the purpose? What is the question that's really being asked and what is the purpose? Because they all ultimately go to the rights and obligations that the parties have. And is it a contractual right or is it a right that arises somewhere else under statute, for example? This is the methodology. Have you been shown Iraq at some point? It's not my favourite. We'll all learn different ways of doing things. Um, but Iraq is as good a way as any to start and particularly for the online students who will be doing um, the discussion board problem tasks. But for the rest of you, if you decide to do them, I will give you feedback using the Iraq method. Did you identify the issues? Now, why I say it's not my favourite, the one I learnt at school, like, that's my favourite because that's what I'm used to doing, right? Um, it's not because it's any better or worse, but the thing, it, it's often referred to as MIRAT, it's, and that is uh, material fact, issues, rules, application, and then tentative conclusion. Because unless you're Justice Kaifel, you don't get, and you've got the full bench of the High Court behind you, you don't get to know for sure what the end result is. Uh, so in order to do issues, the thing that I would point out to you each time is that you need to identify material facts as well. You need to make sure that you've, um, you've understood what's relevant to the problem and what is not relevant to the problem. Okay, before I move on to talking about what agreement is, do we have any questions, concerns, frustrations? Anything that we want to deal with? I love it when you're all quiet. So uh, in the online tutorial on Sunday, we'll work through some of um, the problems? Um, it'll that. depend on where we get yeah. to tonight and what we do on Sunday. I'm still, because this timing for me is new too. Yeah. Probably should have introduced with that. All my classes have been prepared for years on the basis that I get three hours with you and then I was sneaking in an extra hour that was available if people wanted it or not for uh, where we did mainly problem solving. Um, chances are that there will need to be a little bit more content in the one hour depending on how it goes. So we'll either, again, it's going to be sort of t treading water a little bit as we work out what's the best use of that time. Will it be doing case summary stuff and largely what I'll be doing today is a little bit of throwing cases at you and making sure that you understand how to read them um, and then it'll depend whether we do problems or not. If we do problems or when we do problems, um, I will do problems that are not yet due. So if, um, uh, so if we do a problem on uh, Sunday night, it won't be the problem that's in the discussion board. Okay, because that otherwise it just would be unfair for those people who it goes to their marks. 
sorry, any other questions? Just interrupt me. I'm very interruptible. Um, this is pretty much our roadmap for getting through the next, uh, the rest of tonight and into the next week. We're going to start with our offer and acceptance analysis. We're going to start by working on an objective basis whether there's an offer, by working out what counts as an offer and what doesn't. We're going to talk a little bit about unilateral and bilateral contracts. We've already done that. We're going to talk about whether the offer can be re revoked and then we're going to flip it around and work out whether the offer has been accepted. So we can work out objectively and we use an objective test at each stage what constitutes an acceptance and has that in fact happened. Um, we're going to look at whether the acceptance has been communicated or not. We're going to apply that by looking at a range of different cases to do that. And we'll end by looking at, well, what happens when we can't trace offer and acceptance? How do we find consensus? So this is the classical definition of what agreement is. It's the magic moment of formation when the parties are ad idem. I sort of feel like I need to have Barry White sing this or something. It's like the romantic moment at which the, you know, the egg of the offer suddenly gets <laughs> matched by the sperm of, of acceptance and explodes into forever love. Um, it's only me. I really love contract law, can you tell? Uh, so this is, this is ultimately what we're looking for. We find agreement though by looking for offer and acceptance and matching them. Why finding that matching point is important is because it's at the point that offer and acceptance meet that the agreement comes into existence. So it's at that time and in that place. So why would time and place I know if you're a pop star, you name your child after the time and place of conception. But um, for us as contract lawyers, why do we care where and when? Please, and can you remind me your name? Nia. Nia, um, why? Well, the place is important because then that will give rise to the jurisdiction that the contract So the place is important because that tells us what the jurisdiction is, and the jurisdiction is the place the laws of that place will apply to the contract. Time? Um, Why do we think time's important? Hmm. Well, you, maybe, maybe again, the law that's relevant to that particular point in time. Law could be relevant. Absolutely. So if a statute came into effect on a particular day, it might be relevant whether it was before or after. Billy, what have you got? Would it be to potentially influence Lapsing that offer as well? It could go to the question of whether or not an offer had lapsed or not. So did the acceptance come in in time? If an acceptance didn't come in on time and it could have lapsed, then we don't have a contract. If it did, we could have. Again, the cases that you've read, some of them will give you examples. So if an offeror died in the interim period, for example, the offer may have lapsed would be a good example. Uh, although there are cases that say if you didn't know about that, that you still could accept. Uh, time can also be relevant for a whole lot of reasons that have got nothing to do with us here tonight, like um, which tax year something falls into, or even which GST quarter or month that reporting fits into. There can be a whole heap of reasons why you need to know the time. Um, they range. The jurisdiction is the most important of those. So this idea, I'm, I'm not a big believer in Latin. Like, I like when I say disbelieve in Latin, it's not like a climate change or anything like that. I, I absolutely believe in the existence of Latin, um, but I'm pretty <laughs> much, I also am a believer in climate change, although I'm, anyway, I'm just going to stop, Kath, stop. All right, my brain is going in a funny thing. Um, consensus ad idem is one of the few terms that you really need to know. There are a number of them. On the whole, when we have a Latin term, 
it's because it sums up something that is so abundantly clear if we said it in plain English that people wouldn't pay us the big bucks for the information. Case in point, my favourite Latin expression is re ipsa locuta. Anybody know what it means? The words speak for themselves. If they spoke for themselves, why do you need to put them in Latin? I don't understand. Um, but there are some where they work as a code for bringing us into the same place. And this one in particular, consensus ad idem, is something much more than just plain consensus. It's about being of the one mind in relation to the subject matter. So it brings intention and agreement into that same space. So in order to determine whether or not an agreement has in fact been reached, whether we've got consensus ad idem, the courts will use what we call an objective test. Would anybody be kind enough to explain what they think an objective test is? Nia, can you help us out again? It's where the, uh, this fictional reasonable person is used to try and determine um, whether or not something has occurred as opposed to kind of looking at the actual intention that existed within the two people. So it's from the outside. Would a reasonable person think that, given the facts, an agreement was made? Okay, did everybody hear that? So Nia started with this idea of the fictional reasonable person. The cases, Lord Denning in particular, used to refer to the man on the Clapham omnibus, which is not really a reasonable person in our minds at all, but that particular, they're always men, by the way, always men, and they're in Britain for some reason. Um, but yet the question is not what you, a, the parties thought or meant by their words at the time that they did something. The question is, what would a reasonable person having the same information as the parties have thought that the conduct or the, um, or the words meant? So Nia's absolutely right. We come from the outside and look in. We don't inside out. So if we go inside out, that's being subjective applying a subjective test to the question of whether or not somebody wanted to enter into an agreement or not. Now, why would it matter whether we use a subjective or an objective test? Surely, if I'm a party to a contract, I'm, I'm the best placed person to say what I meant. Because you have vested interest or potential emotion. Sorry, what's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca has just said because I might have vested interest or potentially emotion involved in talking, uh, uh, saying what I meant. Um, and the situation could, it's absolutely right, and the situation could change. My memory of what went on might be clouded by what happened subsequently. Absolutely. So when we think back to last week, when we were talking about what a contract is even for or why we have contract laws, one of the things that we hit on was that there's an economic advantage in ensuring that contracts are dealt with consistently. So there are, if contracts are dealt with consistently, then commercial people know when they enter into a contract, if they do one thing, it'll be dealt with in a particular way, and if they do another thing, it will be dealt with in a different way. So at risk of putting too fine a point on it, as a commercial person, I know that if I enter into a contract and I keep my promise, then the other party will have to pay me or keep their promise, whatever kind of promise they have. And as a commercial person, I know that if I don't keep my promises, um, that the other party will have rights to sue me, either to terminate the contract or for damages or a range of different delightful things that you'll get to think about in advanced contract law. But I know what that is. Like, is it a crime to break a promise? Do I go to jail if I don't keep my promises? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Can you remind me of your name? Uh, Holman. Holman. So not necessarily, absolutely. Now, there are circumstances where it might be criminal conduct to make promises and then not keep them. 
particularly if you are entrapping people or if you are directors of companies that don't keep your promises to keep your employees safe, for example. There are a range of circumstances where the act, which is associated with not keeping a promise, is also a crime. But on the whole, we have for contract law this private law arrangement where effectively we've entered into a contract, we've each made promises to the other, we've set out a structure for how our private law is going to work between us and if one of us breaks that promise then there will be a set of consequences that are effectively standard. I've made it sound easier than potentially it is but um, I think you understand. So the traditional, contra uh, traditional doctrine of contract law is based on this, these days in my view, almost fictional idea that one person makes an offer, another person considers that offer and accepts it, and a contract is formed and the relationship is clear. Now if you think back to the type of contracts that you may or may not have entered into recently, chances are very few of them had any level of negotiation. You may not have even known what the terms of your contract were the time that you entered into. You probably had access to it. Case in point, my NBN contract. It might surprise you to know I did not negotiate with TPG line by line what they were going to do and what I was going to do. It didn't work that way. Um, I, there was a contract there on a take it or leave it basis. So in a nutshell, this is the most important thing I suspect that you're going to get out of today, is that if we have an offer and we match it with an acceptance, then we have agreement. It's as simple as that. So the offer, however, needs to be clear and capable of acceptance on its terms. The whole idea of what an offer is that's capable of acceptance is intrinsically linked with this idea of certainty, which we will continue on with in a couple of weeks. Why do you think it's important that the offer itself has is capable acceptance on its terms? <coughs> Bless you. Let me go into the next point, I'll come back to that question. Acceptance needs to be communicated to the offeror without variation or amendment of the offer. So at risk of spoiling the plot uh, here, uh, if we have a, uh, an acceptance, a conditional acceptance, so let me, let me give you an example. I would like to sell this computer to you for a million dollars and you say I'd like to buy that computer but I'm not going to pay more than fifty dollars. Are you accepting my offer? Could you call it a conditional acceptance? Everything other than the price is fabulous. I love this computer. You could call it a conditional acceptance but it's actually a counter offer. So unless you say yes, no contract is made. Now if you were to say I won't pay more than $100 and I say okay you can have it for $100, am I accepting your counter offer or what am I doing? Think about the reading. Okay. Let that swim around in your brains for a little while. We will come back to that question. So my original question here was, why does it need to be clear and capable of acceptance? In particular, I'm interested in why does it need to be clear? Why is it linked to certainty? Why do we need to make sure that the terms and conditions are in the offer? Mm -hmm. Others. <laughs> I was going to say accountability. Accountability, yeah? So you're Stephanie, right? Yeah. Sorry, I will pick up names. Billy, what were you going to say? Could it have something to do with if I'm offering something that's so vague, am I actually intending to offer something? It could, 
the question of whether or not you intended could go to, uh, we could sort that out by looking at uh, the quality. I think, there's, I think there's actually a simpler answer. There's somebody, sorry, can you tell me your name? Edie. Edie, nice um, to meet you. Um, <laughs> is it so there's clarity around whether or not the computer's been filled? Like the office's been provided? You're closer, you're closer. If I just go back a couple of steps here, if we just think about this, if we've got an offer, in fact, I feel like I need to draw this as my sperm and egg kind of analogy. If we've got the egg, which is the offer, it's sitting there with, you know, two X's, lots of DNA just travelling around in it, and then we've got acceptance, and all it's, you know, all we have to do is pop acceptance into that egg there, and we get a whole new human, sometimes two, oh, actually, agreement, sorry, an agreement. It exists from this point in time. Can you see that if we only need those two, if it just needs acceptance, then the offer itself needs to contain everything, what I like to call the DNA of the contract. Okay, it needs to carry that DNA because if we can't work out what a contract would look like here, then we probably don't have an offer or, and we definitely don't have certainty. At this point, we just need it to be capable of acceptance and to have everything in it. I know your name, it's Aisha. 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 Yeah. Thank you. So, do you mean like we need consideration? You will, well, at this stage we need offer. So the offer itself will need to be able to, uh, from the offer we'll need to, ident need to identify what the consideration is. Now I'm not even going to talk to you about what consideration is beyond price today. But that's what we need to be able to do. We would need to be able to work out what the consideration is. We would need to be able to work out what each party has promised the other from the offer. So if I go back to my example before, would you like to buy this computer from me? It will cost you $100. I can give it to you today. Um, it comes with no software. Um, and I don't have any idea whether or not it's got virus protection on it or not. I would suspect that that's enough to be an offer. You know, all you have to do is give me $100. I could give it to you today. Uh, I would say there's an implied promise in there, which is untrue, that I own this computer. I do not. Um, it does have software on it. Um, and I certainly can't guarantee it's not riddled with viruses. Um, but can you see the important things are there? Maybe a even simpler one, somebody, a cup of coffee, somebody's got a cup of coffee here. Okay, at some point today, they went to a coffee shop. There was a menu, I'm guessing. Maybe not. It said coffees. I'm just going to guess. Skinny latte, $4.50. There was a menu there. Is that menu an offer to sell cups of coffee? No, it's not. It actually turns out it's an invitation to treat. So, which we'll get to in a minute, but I'm glad to see we're all on the same page. Uh, the person who purchased the cu cup of coffee has gone to the counter. They've asked for what they want. They want, technically what they're doing is they're making an offer to purchase a cup of coffee at the listed price. Often that'll be a wordless transaction. You will be a reasonable person observing from the outside what the steps are, will see the contract play out in real time and it will be executed effectively when the second to occur of handing over the money, handing over the coffee happens.